Hello everybody. Good morning. It's still, yeah, still 45 minutes till good morning. Welcome to uh, a, a panel discussion on how to execute exceptional product feedback loops. Uh, my name is Varun. Uh, I will be the moderator for this panel. Uh, to quickly introduce myself, uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, Interpret. Uh, at, I'm the guy who made that running pitch yesterday. Uh, so, but once again, with 30 second summary, uh, at Enterprise we're building uh, unified customer feedback intelligence. So we unify all of your customer feedback across support calls, sales calls, surveys, social media, Zendesk tickets, whatever you may have, into a single time series database and convert, make it available for action and analysis through like custom AI models for every customer. And this is a topic that we are very passionate about. It's like a, an emerging use case that we see for Interpret from a lot of our most forward-looking customers. And when you got a chance to moderate this panel, uh, this was the most obvious topic in my mind because uh, I have personally have deep conviction that this will become more and more of a, uh, a top uh, driver uh, for the best support teams uh, and customer experience teams uh, in the coming years. Uh, I'm also honored to have three wonderful uh, humans uh, with me. Uh, as uh, my fellow panelists, I will quickly introduce themselves, uh, quickly introduce them and then ask them to share a little bit about them which uh, I may have missed and then we'll dive right into the things. From an agenda perspective, I hope to ask questions for about 20-25 minutes and then we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for audience Q&A. I feel like it's always far more fun and productive and more insightful when you do it that way. To my extreme left, we have Andrea. Andrea is the VP of Technical Support at DreamHost. DreamHost is a domain registration and website hosting platform used by over 1.5 million websites. Andrea has been there for 20 years, started as a member, as a support rep, and has grown all the way up to leading the function, is now part of the executive team of the company. So really excited to have Andrea and learn from that experience of evolving support over such a long period of time in such a competitive category. So very excited to have Andrea on today's panel. Um, next up, we have Desiree. Desiree is the director of product support at Drone Deploy. Drone Deploy is a drone software platform used by over 5,000 companies, including some of the largest oil and gas construction and renewable energy companies. When you think about uh, having customers where and having a software where stakes are high, this is as high stakes as it gets in that context. And lastly, we have Michael. Michael is a part of the research org at Figma and leads the voice of customer program specifically within Figma. Figma, as of all you know, is the global leader in software design and team collaboration. Recently valued $10 billion sometimes seemed way too powerful that the acquisition had to be cancelled because incredibly successful company, very well admired as well. Really excited to have these three wonderful people with very, we have a consumer product company with a software company used by millions of people. We have very high stakes B2B company and then we have Figma, which is product-led growth, both consumer and very high enterprise as well. So welcome all. And so just to get things started, maybe you could share a little bit about either yourself or your company, which I may have missed in my introduction and then we'll get the ball going. Andre, maybe you want to start? Hello. Hi. So, Andrea, I'm originally from Hungary and been living in the U.S. for quite a while. And this job has been like my first real job. And I just got stuck there because it was a great company to work for. And I really like to do support still, even as an exec. And our company, as mentioned, it's semi mid-sized company considered, just one of the fish in the big pond of uh, web hosting, and we've been around since before the, the dot-com boom of 2000. So we survived and we're thriving, not just surviving at this point, but it really, it really something is that behooves us to pay attention to customer feedback because the only way to survive is to gain and retain the customers based on that information and do it better than the other, how many other company that does the same thing that we do. Hey all, I'm Desiree uh, with Drone Deploy. I have been with, uh, with that company for about three years, but I've been in software support in, in one form or another for about 20 years. Actually, last month is my 20th anniversary in the industry. I know. Um, and in general, I would say that my uh, experience is mostly around taking teams from the B to the B to E motion, where we're moving up market and, and trying to cater more toward the enterprise space. And so that's essentially what we're doing here at Drone Deploy, where we're uh, working with 
one person with a drone, but also working with some of the largest uh, corporations in the world who are trying to build out their own reality capture program and use it for inspection or asset management. So, okay. Thanks. Awesome. Hey everyone, I'm Michael. I lead VOC at uh, Figma, and prior to that, uh, I've been here about two and a half years, but prior to that, I led voice of customer at Asana as well, and worked primarily on how do you build a voice of customer program as an input into product planning. So I'm just super excited to be here, really passionate about this topic. I think it's, like Varun said, I think that thinking about how to manage customer feedback used to feel like a chore, and now I feel like it's a competitive advantage. You have to do it. And we're thinking about it as like, how do you build the insights infrastructure to really feel product development, customer intuition, and customer empathy? So super excited to chat with you guys today. Great. Wonderful. Uh, all right. The way we'll have the discussion, just to make sure we are all aligned. So when you think about product feedback loops, it typically can be broken down into two parts. One is you have this universe of customers who are asking questions, complaining, requesting things, asking for help over like multiple channels, support tickets, social media, even reviews sometimes. And then support teams and VOC teams, like we're responsible for responding to that feedback quickly, efficiently, and correctly. But at the same time, there's like wealth of insights and information coming from that large stream of feedback and being able to know who, what type of feedback is coming from what type of customer. And then we have to be the conduit of information and pass that along to relevant product design, even marketing, engineering executive teams with the right context so that everyone in the business can learn from the voice of the customer in a timely manner with the right context. So that's like first part of the loop, like what challenges occur there, what's the right way to do it. And the second part is company as its own has its own, obviously you are executing and learning from customer feedback and that plays a, is one, of the, one of the many inputs into how you think about building a strong business or designing a roadmap. There's something about a broader company strategy as well and other initiatives which are not primarily baked in immediate customer feedback but are important. So how do we communicate either updates based on customer feedback that have been made or different strategy which doesn't align with customer pain back to the market and back to the universe of customers as well so that they don't feel frustrated, they understand and they feel that this thing that they're paying money for on a regular basis and have a relationship with of continued usage they have a context and understanding as to why something is being done or not done. Those are two parts that we'll discuss, basically. Um, and then, yeah, we'll open up for audience Q&A after that. Maybe just to kick it off in, in very simple things, like when I think about things as to just why anything, like why even do it? Because sometimes we just like gloss over that. <laughs> maybe just to kick things off, we'd love to open it up to Andrea, maybe. Um, DreamHost, as you said, extremely competitive category. The company's been around for over 25 years, has survived and thrived. How, like... How have you seen the importance of just customer feedback loops internally within the company either evolve or appreciate over time? And what role have you had to play in that? So yeah, we have come a long way from the beginnings of a small company that just listened to what customers wanted. And the customers were initially friends. So basically, we built things for friends and how they wanted to use the internet. And, and then we went into a suggestion page and that was like interesting and ideas were coming in. But as we grew, that page just degenerated to a noisy little abandoned whatever where suggestions went to die because nobody owned it, nothing was actioned on. So it, it, came, it became like a, a source for like losing trust of the customers, losing faith of the customers in um, being ever listened to. And then we realized that if we don't do that, then um, they're going to be like, oh, you're just one of the, the providers. I can talk to somebody else who will give me what I want because um, we realize that many customers want a sort of like for something that they are paying for. They want to be part of the decision making. And, they, and we need to build things for them, not just things that our developers love working on. We had to find a balance on figuring out what we are providing for the market, what we are providing for our customers, and what we are providing for potential customers. Mm -hmm. Not just build continuously for the, co the customer base that we have, but like how do we get other people who are interested in what we are trying to do. So we had to figure out how to actually listen to customers and how to action on those on the feedback. And, and another thing about uh, listening to customers when you do things for them, they will likely become your long-term customers and start telling people about it. And we all know that it's cheaper to get customers uh, via word of mouth 
than any sort of marketing acquisition or affiliates or whatever. So it saves money if you listen. Yeah, absolutely. Customer lifetime value is the single most important business metric, in my opinion. You absolutely yeah, very well said. Uh, I also like what you said is when you talk about like the tricky balance. I think a lot of us will have to face is being able to appropriately section off the voice of current customers by segment or, or by use case and the voice of future customers that you would want to acquire, which is aligned with the company strategy. And like, how are you like listening to both? I think that's a very tricky balance, but also an important point you highlighted. Desiree, I would love for you to chime in. Drone Deploy, we have reality capture, like drone software platform used by several large like construction sites, oil and gas companies, renewable energy companies, like talk about just like a very high stakes <laughs> software product with how in that context, in that environment, very with that many large ent enterprise customers with such a high, in a high stake environment, what is the the appreciation or the importance of balancing urgency and importance of like customer feedback coming in for different issues and communicating internally. If you could share like what has worked well or something that has you've had lessons learned on that front at Drone Deploy. <laughs> sure, that's a that's a great question. So we do every day to balance, right? Because we find that sometimes feedback can become something that be a blocker to renewal, right? If there's something that a, a large customer has been asking for and we are not continually not providing that, then that's something that can come up in that conversation. And But we, don't, we also don't necessarily want to be held hostage to what one particular customer wants to do. And it, it's important to understand whether the feedback that is being requested is something that, one, is that one customer worth us pausing and, and working on that particular functionality? Or two, is it something that m more of our customers are going to find valuable or more of our prospects, to your point? And is it in alignment with the direction that we want to go as a company? Because there are times when we receive feedback, to Andrea's point, about um, form becoming a place where feedback goes to die. If you choose as a business not to do some new piece of functionality or something that someone's asking for, it, it can make people upset. But if you have a company direction, you have a company direction, and you're trying to listen to the market, and you're trying to understand what's going to be needed for you to continue to be a viable business and make money, and that may not be what Joe Schmo is asking for yep. in his quarterly calls. It's a very, you have to have a very diplomatic conversation, I think, from yep. time to time. Yep, yep. Right? That's one of the, probably the most like underappreciated part of balancing that. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah. And that's what a, a really good customer success manager can do, I think, is be able to delicately have that conversation. And we're not afraid to pull in the product managers, too. Yeah. We need to have that conversation and talk about roadmap and direction and make sure that at a strategic level, your champion at the customer site knows where we're going and they will, they get excited to come along for the ride. Yep. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So thank you, yeah, very well said. Um, maybe going a little tactical, and I'll, I'll love to bring uh, Michael in for this. Michael, you you were Asana for several years, uh, built up the voice of customer program there, uh, brought into Figma. Um, I think it has an inc uh, incredible history of the company, where it was in stealth for six, seven years, when, but when it started selling, it just flew off the shelf. Incredibly passionate user base from, like, individual designers to the largest of enterprises. When it comes to Figma, everyone expects everything to work like magically all the time. So very high expectations also. So in, an, in a hyper growth environment like that, when you join in um, and so many things happening in parallel, how did you go about setting up the infrastructure to, as you said, right, to make sure that the voice of customer team can be the conduit of information to the right team at the right channel in the right context and it can scale over time as well without any negative consequences. So would love to hear like the, the story behind that. And like how you, like tactically, how did you go about implementing as a new VOC leader at Figma in with so much changing yeah. in that environment? Yeah, I think I feel extremely blessed to have the even opportunity to call myself like a voice of customer practitioner. I think not a lot of companies invest in it and not a lot of companies have that as a program. So to have the opportunity to do it at two different companies, I've learned a lot, mostly through mistakes, but lots of lessons learned. I, I think the key thing to, that I've learned in my experience building and scaling VOC programs is like you have to know what the product building culture is like. And you have to tailor the feedback loops in order to serve in that. Because I don't think anyone in the room is going to argue like, oh, customer feedback is important. Or customer insights is like a wealth of knowledge. That's a no-brainer. But what really matters is how do you design your feedback loops 
so that it is in service of how you build products within your company. So for example, at Asana, me personally, I was like, oh, I, I would love to build out the VOC program. It's an opportunity to, to help the organization become more customer centric and be, feel closer connected to the customers. That's what excites me. However, we had to align on like the company objective for why we have this VOC program. And at Asana, it was very much in service of to help identify and understand the most important needs to inform the product roadmap. So it really was about this planning cycle, this really big six month feedback loop, right? I got to Figma, totally different. I tried to do this six month thing and they were like, yeah, we already know all this. I'm like, okay, then why am I here? And I learned that Figma's culture, they prefer more faster feedback loops. They wanna know what customers are talking about every day and they want ambient awareness of what people are talking about because that fuels the customer empathy, the customer intuition, and the evidence for product managers, designers, and engineers to know what to prioritize rather than wait six months to be like, okay, what should we do next? They already have a roadmap. The approach has been very different in that aspect. Yeah, yeah very interesting. I think I lo love the point of VOC program has to adapt to product building and in some ways even the company culture basically right it is it's maybe even two direct competitors probably even in the same category probably deserve like a, a different voc program depending on just what the product building culture uh, is going to look like so it's a very interesting point for sure i think just taking a, a slightly different perspective that of the second half of the question how which is like you're communicating like bugs and issues and feature requests on an ongoing basis from customers and potential customers to the product team, the leadership team. And then as updates are made or as the company strategy changes, how do you balance the communication of just letting them know, like closing the loop from that perspective that, hey, this thing that you wanted, we have now built it. Or this thing that you want, and I know we've been asking for it, we're not gonna build it, basically. That's not gonna happen, and here's why. Would love to hear both parts. have. Has that, have you been, when you've tried that, has it worked well? Has it not worked well? Any lessons you can share from that perspective? Michael, since you have the mic, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, I think closing the loop is key, right? I think we've talked about it here. If you're doing a good job building a, a product and a company, you're naturally going to have champions that feel intrinsically motivated to help you advance your product and, and feel connected to you. And so a lot of times these champions are taking on a second job to basically champion, onboard, administrate your product within their company. In, in a B2B sense. So to me, closing the loop is helping fulfill that champion's need in, in a context where we're not ever compensating them for that time and energy. Yep. So it's really the only thing, it's, to me it's an obligation to close the loop because it's delivering on that need for them to feel heard, to feel involved in, in a co-creative process. How you do that is really hard because you think about it, you're like, okay, I have to track every feature request, I have to like map it to the product roadmap, I have to know when that's coming, and then I have to like email them, and it, by the time you get there, people are like, it's not feasible, what's the ROI on that? And most people don't do it. So for me, what I've done is I've intentionally designed the feedback loops to capture the user who asked for that feature as often as we can. And a lot of companies don't do this, because they, they, they'd rather do the like, just let me tell sales to do plus one on the feature request, let me just do plus one which is faster for the sales rep, but then now we miss on the opportunity to close the loop. By capturing user ID, user email with the feature requests in, throughout different channels, you throw it in interpret, now you can export a list of everyone that's over time has asked for this feature, mm -hmm. give me all the user IDs, now all I gotta do is send a CSV over to the product marketing team and say, hey, make sure to send out, like, include these people in the launch email or send out personalized email saying, thank you, we built the thing you've asked for. And also, another thing we've done is like, it, enrich it with Salesforce data. So now you have the user, the sales rep, and now you, have, you can just filter by sales rep and say, hey, here's an opportunity for you to re-engage with yeah. customers because we have something to offer them now. Yeah. Right? So not only are you helping the customer, you're helping sales rep nurture their relationships because they want to have a gift back to the customer and say, hey, we heard you, we built it. Sorry it took so long, but it's now coming. And that's just a, a reinforcing practice to just continue this feedback loop flywheel. Yeah, and that's, I love the point around that. It's almost an obligation because you have people who are championing your product or your you know, software within your company like free of charge. And so you have to treat them as if they're part of your own team and keep them in the loop. Um, and also that you can actually leverage it as an opportunity to earn more revenue also. Like if you're able to like nurture, get some dormant prospects reignited, that's an interesting, very good point as well. Desiree at Drone Deploy, like how, if you could share any lessons learned around 
trying to close the loop with customers, what has worked well, what has not worked well, any, anything you could share in, th in that context? We're terrible at this. <laughs> <laughs> No, we, it, it really has been challenging. What you were just describing, I was thinking, oh my gosh, that sounds absolutely amazing. Can we please do that? And really, it depends on what we're talking about. If we're talking about, I, I guess you could say that we're really good at it at the macro level. So if there's new functionality coming out, we've got a really great marketing engine that's taking those, those announcements and putting them into emails and campaigns and LinkedIn. And we have a beautiful, what do you call it? Not a blog. What the heck is the word? When somebody's talking in a video? Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> we have a wonderful podcast where we're talking about new features and functionality and like getting that buzz going, getting people excited. And we're in a pretty cutting edge industry in reality capture and three-dimensional modeling. And, and it's cool, exciting stuff that people really get jazzed about talking about. So that part, great, beautiful. But when we're talking about, did you fix that thing that 10 people are complaining about we really have some work to do there. And I think that we do sometimes make sure that our, for our larger customers, our customer success managers are aware of a particular feature request or bug that someone is concerned about. And we will work with the CSM to close that loop. But specifically in support, we're trying to move on. We're on to the next thing. And so we don't often close the loop, I think, as we should. Yeah. It is, it's real. That's, it's, been, um, it's been an interesting challenge, but with, some of the new functionality that is available in the industry and in the world right now, I'm pretty excited about being able to solve that problem. Yep. Yeah, very well said. If I could maybe just double click on one point you said, what, because maybe some folks, it will resonate with the folks might be thinking in the audience. What is the hard part about it? Like when you think about the real world trade-offs, right? Like there is motivation to do it, but there's so much happening. And is it a, a tracking issue, a communication, a prioritization issue? If you could elucidate, what have you learned? Which part of that not being able to do it is the hardest that you've seen? I think it, it, it being in support, keeping people in the loop is directly counter to some of the metrics that we're trying to achieve, right? Because if we have a ticket where someone has reported an issue and we know that it's gonna be fixed in a couple of months, I don't wanna leave that ticket open for two months. M one, that's not a great experience because they're checking back and you're, nope, not yet, soon, not yet and then it just bombs our metrics as well. So yeah. that's really the, yeah. the yeah. big challenge. Makes sense, makes sense. Yeah, yeah well, I, I would add to that, the, the biggest challenge we're facing now is the traceability of feedback from like question, complaint, feature request, idea, something on the roadmap feature, and just tracing that through and be able to connect the dots of like, oh, that's, this request is now a feature, it's going on the roadmap. How do we find all of those people that ask for that? So that's a coordination problem that we have with just like our product teams and our product marketing teams that's very solvable, um, but doable. But I would highly encourage like you guys to try one time a campaign where you do a personalized email to customers to close the loop. You'd be blown away with the responses you get from people. How many times have you guys given a, a company or a product feedback and your expectation is they're not listening. You're just like, hey, I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm just gonna tell you this because hopefully you do something about it. But when you do that and people respond, their minds are blown by, oh my God, I didn't think anyone was listening to me. And so we tried it once at Asana and the head of product was like, holy cow. Like you went from, we were shipping this really risky change in the core product to, I can't believe you guys replied to 26,000 people's feedback in a personalized way and just earned so much trust with the product team. That became a new expectation mm. that they were willing to engage resources to make that a new norm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's, thank you for sharing those examples, man. Always highlight the point. So I think like the next part, which I we we're, which I think is top of mind for all of us, is like uh, we're also like in a special moment in history, I would say, of going through this like massive platform shit, which some people think maybe as big or even bigger than the evolution of internet itself since that chat GPT moment happened in November 2022. And I think personally, I feel like there are lot of hammers looking for a nail, okay, where can I use AI? <laughs> Basically, what do I use with AI? What's your AI strategy? But probably the most highly impactful, a very obvious use case is leveraging AI to better synthesize, learn, and act on customer feedback because that's a data set that already exists within a business over several years. It's just sitting there in silos. Uh, unfortunately, in many cases, just rotting away. So with this context, and I think with, with all of your experiences, I think maybe starting with uh, Andrea, your like hope or aspiration on any experiments you've tried of like, with this 
special moment in history that we have of this massive platform shift, which part of these two loops, basically like the converting the voice of the customer to internal action items or summaries for the leadership team or communicating the internal strategy to the external world, would love to hear any thoughts of like how you view any of these parts, these two sections could become easier, more effective, and how what th it could evolve it for any of, in any of your teams, basically. Yeah, I just want to take a, a quick step back and talk about another quick revolution that I feel like is happening, is that support is finally becoming the source that is being listened to, that we are, while we don't always have the, the voice of customer function, we are the voice of customer, and, and we have finally gotten to the point where we are being listened to, where our feedback is valued and, and is valuable and reliable. We no longer have to fight to, this is what customers want. We hear it every day, every minute, when we are interacting, when well, listen to us, and backing up with data, which is now easier to get because of AI and for other reasons. So I feel like that's also, I consider that a shift, a revolution. Mm -hmm in how we are collecting and building on creating better products and infrastructure for our customers. As far as AI, we are a technical, technological and developer company, so we usually build our own things, so we have been dabbling with creating AI-based solutions for scraping data from customer tickets, customer interactions, to not only get the explicit please make this blue sort of thing, but the implicit issues that if we see customers are having issues or writing about certain things, and even if they don't say that they have that problem, we see that as a trend mm -hmm. and we can action on that and use that to um, not just reduce incoming volumes because that's great, but to make something for the customers, improve the AI, improve the product, improve reliability of infrastructure by getting that information out of, I'm gonna say about 11,000 interactions that we have weekly wow. with our customers. And, and then the other thing is the exit reports. We have exit reports of those that are willing to talk to us, not a lot of people, but when they have something to say, they say things that we need to be listening to. And that is also being scanned and looked at. Not just, uh, we are doing it on a human level, but also with AI, again, looking for the kind of trends. And of course, we have our CSET surveys as support. And while they are gushing about how amazing my team is, there is still valuable information for the product and infrastructure teams to, to action on and see something needs to be done. And we do that not by manually reading all those things, but using AI to, to summarize the trends mm -hmm. and the ideas that we can then take back to whoever can make a difference. And like I said at the beginning, it is not being listened to and actioned on. Fantastic. Thank you for adding that context, Andrea. Desiree, anything from your side in the context of drone deploy versus AI revolution? Is it like, where is, as a leader on the, of the team, where is your head at? I just think about what could, could this be helpful for closing the loop with customers, like better analysis, synthesis, or just broadly wherever you think is like the most impactful application of AI in customer support for your business? Sure. We're dabbling with AI in, in a few different capacities. We A couple of our founders have PhDs in machine learning and artificial intelligence. So they're real into tinkering. <laughs> and so we have a, a few different things that are happening. One of which is in our product where we're building out an AI based, sorry, co-pilot. We're going to be able to provide analyses to customers on some of their data inputs, but also give them a place to ask questions and to provide feedback. And that will all be sent into us and then we can take action on it. But we're also using AI to ingest things like our engineering escalations. So we've got engineering managers dropping JIRA ticket data into AI to understand what some of those trends are, where people are getting stuck, where they can potentially reduce engineering time to by building better products. So there's that angle. And then there's also the product managers who are interested in kind of end user ticket data, not so much our escalations. But we have all of our support ticket data in a central data warehouse. And so some of the things that are happening, I'm not even fully 
clued in on because we have PMs who are doing their own reporting and tinkering with AI tools and they're coming to me and telling me, you'll never guess what I found. Mm. And so we're, it's the wild west right now, but there's a lot of really exciting things happening. Yeah, that's great. Uh, first of all, I think it's a kudos that the, the, the customer support ticket data has been centralized so that you're not like the support team doesn't feel like the the gatekeepers of the data is hey it's accessible if you want to tinker on it go ahead and secondly good to see like uh, it seems like at both DreamHost and and drone deploy teams have jumped on to see what they can make use of this incredibly valuable data set uh, using AI uh, that's great to see Michael what's it been like at Figma yeah I have, I have a confession I'm a AI optimist so I've been uh, no, tinkering no. since <laughs> around November and, and Varun's familiar since I've been asking for AI powered features and interpret. So one thing I mentioned earlier is understanding your feedback loops as infrastructure. And at Figma, what we're trying to do is build a push, a pull, and a platform approach to this whole infrastructure. And how we're using AI is trying to be experimental but smart in all the different processes and workflows within that push, pull, platform play. So a few examples is like when we push feedback from like sales or support to the product team, sometimes PMs are kind of weird people. They're like, oh, I don't want, I don't want solutions. I want problems. Or I, I, just give me the feature request. Or what do people actually want? And then you give them that. And they're like, no, I don't want this. <laughs> so we use AI there to review, summarize, but also repackage the feedback. Rewrite this as a user story or follow this user need statement that's in one sentence. Mm -hmm. And that makes it kind of bite-sized, digestible. And then we can just push that into Slack. And then you have this ambient push awareness of, oh, OK, I've heard that a million times. On the platform side, we use Interpret so we can then set up smart searches and then just set up automated alerts. So here's your weekly top feedback summary for FigJam for the week. And just like push that in Slack, make that a routine, and just continue to build that ambient awareness. And then you have the more deeper kind of like AI-powered synthesis and, and like analysis where you're like, pull all of the data, break this up into themes, give me specific examples, Organize this by my like product road like product team. So infer what team should be this should get routed to. So I just think like I'm excited because I think finally qualitative data and like support ticket data and all of this customer feedback is finally getting the attention that like all the data scientists have had for years and years, right? Like all the expectations from quant data, now people have the same expectation and, and appreciation for qualitative data. And I think that is part of this kind of like AI um, movement with support being such a valuable source of information. Yeah, I think there's a very important point in what you said, Michael, which is like the, uh, historically, customer feedback has been riddled with I would say, the three biases. The confirmation bias, which you want to build something, you find one example which suits your narrative. I'm like, well, there, oh, this one person said that. Recency bias, someone tweets, and that tweet gets 100 likes, and then suddenly that's everyone wants it, apparently, which is not true. And then the biggest bias of all times is the highest paid person's opinion, who is also like a, a negative bias. And I think it's been treated as like just opinions and assumptions, but finally, I think the uh, it is such a joy for me to also hear this term qualitative data, right? Like it's just, it is all the data science effort have been focused on like analytical event, usage data, financial data, but the voice of your customers, the explicit things is saying exactly what they like, they don't like, prompted and unprompted in so many different channels. Like the fact that it's been treated as a data set finally when AI can help harness is a very exciting development for sure. Yeah, 100%. Can I add something? Yeah, please. So just to, you just reminded me that something else that's happening at Drone Deploy is our product managers at the senior level are going into the recordings of all of our sales calls and they're gleaning insights directly that way. So they they'll, they see some trends and then they'll go and listen to a sampling and just understand what people are actually talking about as their pain points. Because once that filters through the sales organization and gets to them in a game of telephone, it can be very different, but they're going directly to the source and, and just trying to understand and pick up on little things that may not actually get mentioned in our voice of customer form yep. that gets filled out. So it's really interesting to hear that they're going direct in that way and looking for trends in pre-sales discussions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, that's a really good point there, which is in the, at the end of the day, nothing hits harder than just the raw customer feedback whether it's like the audio clip or the actual text, like it just it just can't replace it. There's no trend line which can replace the raw customer quote as they said it as it is because uh, it's a very visceral feeling for like 
a product builder or even a company operator, hey, this is what someone who pays for my software or service is exactly what they're saying. But I think what you said is like something very insightful, which is like what AI can do is it can actually route you to the right set of clips or the raw codes, basically, so that you can still feel the empathy. But instead of this unsurmountable thing of we have 5,000 calls of like 40 minutes each, like who, how, what to listen to. But can we, can we find the right 10 clips of a minute each, which conveys that the same emotion uh, that I can then listen to, which like gives me all the context I need. It's a great navigation path for that perspective as well, which is uh, very well said. Uh, on that front. I want to make sure we bring in some folks uh, from the audience as well. Been uh, seeing a lot of visceral nodding uh, throughout the program, which I'm excited to see like, so what questions that people have. All right, let's get into it then. Uh, oh man, <laughs> sorry, the first question. Okay, I will, the first question is so good. I, I will, I have, so, I am the moderator, so I'll resist the temptation to answer it, but thank you for asking this question. I love this question, but it's a very good question. How do you push back on the mentality that if Henry Ford had asked his customers what to build, they would have said, build a faster horse? Andrea, maybe you want to start or anything, you have any your thoughts on this question or? I guess that could be the, the difference between listening to customers a noisy minority of your customers versus what your company is actually trying to build for, what the company is trying to be success, successful at, and building for the potential rather than just the existing. Yep. And then I know what I want to build. It's not going to be a fast horse. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Anything Desiree, Michael? I think in support, when we get those types of inquiries or people are upset because we we don't do a specific thing, I teach them really to be curious about what is the problem that they're actually trying to solve and dig deeper rather than just saying, okay, I'll let the product team know that you want that button over there. Let's talk about yes. why. What are, what, tell me about your workflow and let me understand that and then we can have a better conversation about perhaps there is already a solution. Perhaps we are building something that could solve the underlying thing that you're trying to accomplish. Yep. Yep. Yeah, plus one. I think the I've struggled with this many times, but I think for me, the framing of this is the underlying unmet need that the customer is expressing. And then I'll like, if it's in a spreadsheet out of column, they sometimes refer to it like this. Hmm. And then there's another column. Here's an illustrative feature request, hmm. right? And I think that allows people to pick what they want to see and then engage their mind of, okay, here's a problem to solve versus, oh, uh, We've heard that feature request a million times. We're not building that, right? So I think the, the goal is to be empathetic with the product team and be like, you have lots of constraints. Here's our understanding of the need that customers are expressing. Yep. And that's my responsibility to, to, to communicate that. And hopefully that helps you build a better product. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I think if I could... Um break the fourth wall of my moderator and just chime in for a second. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think... Um, it is the underlying unmet need or the pain that they have. So you want to like really understand the problem for the customer, but the solution is up to you, right? Your business, what meets needs. So the underlying need here is that yeah, your users want to travel faster, right? The current horses are not fast enough. Now company A may decide big strategic bet. We're going to invent automobiles and that is a way to solve this unmet need. Company B might decide, oh, we're going to invest in horse supplements because that will make horse go faster. So that's up to you. But the underlying problem remains the same, which is customers want to travel faster. A really good question, actually. A, a very practical pain point. How would you get product to take your feedback? We share a dashboard that they help build and approve, but they still say it's not useful data. Mike, you start with this. Like. Yeah, this is tricky. As I mentioned, I think every product company is different. I think every VOC program, needs, it's one size fits one. What I've found is that by having empathy for the product team and trying to get your customer-facing folks to have that same empathy as far as what trade-off decisions you have to make, how would you prioritize this against all the other things on the roadmap, and just like understanding that those decisions are hard goes a really long way. So for me, I think what I've seen in a lot of like support orgs is they set an expectation that like success is the product team builds the thing that customers are complaining about. Yes, that is the end goal and, and like the success, but there's also success in just like we're building an infrastructure that helps product teams know what's going on. 
And that might be through ambient awareness and, and understanding that like, hey, now I know the roadmap's locked, but I'm sharing this just so you have it for later. No expectation to do anything now. We're cool. We get it. Versus, hey, this is a 911. Like, we are getting crazy ticket volume. Like, we need to act on this now. And I think that takes empathy and credibility building with the product org and just like a partnership of knowing the left hand and right hand and how they're working in concert. Yep. yep. We, each product manager has their own flavor of reporting that satisfies what they're looking for. But then we also have a role on the support team that we call the product liaison. And that person is essentially an ambassador for the support team. They have an assigned functional area. And so we're able to mix the quantitative with the qualitative because they'll meet regularly and talk about trends, talk about which bugs to prioritize. And it's a great career building and credibility building opportunity for support as an area of growth. But it also just helps to raise the visibility of support, builds trust, and allows us to allows them to ask questions of someone who's answering tickets. And so they get that that level of detail that they might be looking for. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we have a similar role. We call them the project support coordinators, mm -hmm. and they are an essential part of the project process. They are the stakeholders of not just support, but the voice of customer. And it's, it's an essential role, not just an accepted or tolerated one. And uh, there is a very built-up process that concentrates the feedback that is coming from support. So it's just not, not a random one customer said something five minutes ago. It has a group of people assigned who are part of the rollout. So if something goes out, something changes, we push out a new product, there is a group of people who are responsible of handling any sort of incoming support related to that. They feed it back to the coordinators and the coordinators do the assessment take that information back to the project management. And so we, we narrowed the funnel of the information coming in to make it more reliable, more authentic, and more accepted, and more actionable, rather than just like everybody. Everybody has a voice, but we concentrated that voice based on what was needed. And this is the way we were able to not just do a, a drive-by push out and then move on to the next one, but we made the post-rollout, post-change process to be part of the project and thus making sure that the customers actually got what they needed, not what we thought that they needed. And then we gave them the wrong thing or the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I think, one thing that stood out in uh, all three of your answers is, like, to do this effectively, you essentially need at least one person or at least maybe a, a couple of people who are like inside creators, like whose job is to convert the raw stream of customer feedback and package it in a way that the product team can absorb it in a more natural manner. Like investing in that kind of a functional role will dramatically help solve this like underlying problem that, hey, this is not useful because there is someone dedicated to helping package it in a way that can be easily absorbed. Uh, so that, I think that basically is a, a very good takeaway from that perspective as well. Callan, Lizzie, do we have time for a couple more questions? We don't have, okay. Oh, sorry, Callan's getting really mad at me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, man. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. I want to quickly thank Andrea, Desiree, and Michael for this fantastic discussion. I want to thank all of you for an engaging discussion as well. And uh, yeah, thank you so much.